as I started to dig in, I saw it as a, as a way to quit my regular job, my engineering job that I had for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And so it took me that long to, you know, I hate that it took me that long, 35 years to, to figure all this out. So that's what I'm saying. I, I hope that people that are listening to this decide, well, maybe they want to do it a little quicker in life. Welcome back to How to Invest in Commercial Real Estate. And uh, this is my favorite time of the year. Comes around four times a year and it is distribution time. Distribution time. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is the time of the year where all of our investors are really relying on us. You know, um, you can send out a nice update. You can send out whatever you want, but nothing They don't care about better. that. They only care about- Cold, hard cash. Checks in the mail. In the mail, yeah. So this quarter- it's a, it's, I don't know if it's a milestone. I haven't necessarily been keeping track, but uh, Precision and Criterion both paid out over a million dollars in distributions. What was Precision at? Tell us about we it. We were close to 700,000. I think it was 690, 695. I could double check the math. It was probably 150 checks. Uh, and we've been pretty consistent about 600. We're up now at about 700 and we still have a few properties that aren't fully you know, paying. So that'll, that'll still increase over time. But I tell you what, it's my favorite time of the year. I get four times a year where I get to sit down and, and sign checks to people that have entrusted us with their money. Not only am I happy that we're giving them uh, their returns, uh, but I'm happy that it, that it proves that we're successful at what we do. And we're doing what we told them we were going to do. And we're delivering all that money to them, their friends, their family, their coworkers. And so it's just the best time of the year for us. A million dollars. I had no idea. Of course, we're not a part of the precision, but but you personally are involved in a million dollars every quarter. Sitting out yeah. And I think checks. about it's amazing. How, ble how blessed That's we are. And I, I use the term loosely, but um, how fortunate we are to... <laughs> to deliver a uh, million dollars to people that we know. I don't know people that, that write checks to people they know every quarter for that amount of money. Yeah. I mean, we'll be over probably $4 million this year between the two companies, uh, all going to people that have invested with us. And I think it's powerful. I think it's really cool. Yeah, yeah and great. it takes a lot of faith, faith not only in, in the, like us, right? Because they're having to write us massive checks to get you know little pieces of that yeah. spread out over you know, five, 10 years maybe. There's, there's a lot of trust both ways in that. For but, sure. I mean, that's a ton of money. Anyway, it's a good time. And, and you know, I participate. I love it because I get checks. I, I've invested in some online. Most of them haven't gone well, but some of them have. And, and those they send me checks. I get uh, checks from Criterion. And I get a bunch of checks from Precision Equity, not only from the sponsor side, but also from, uh, I, I put in my personal money uh, on, on a lot of our deals. And so it's just awesome every month for those things to come in. And they don't depend on the amount of uh, work we do. They don't depend on the amount of time we spend. Uh, they they just are there every quarter, and it's awesome. I was excited this morning when I, I got all the emails this morning from Precision, and I was excited to open it up because I knew it was the it was going to tell me how much I was getting back in distributions. And so I got a different email on each property, and I couldn't wait to, to, to check each and every property. And a, a unique uh, point about a couple of those emails is that we've actually paid back over a hundred percent of the capital on at least yeah. three or four of your deals. And yet we still say, Oh, this is an 8%. This is a 24%. Yeah. This is a 15% return on your original investment amount. But on some of these deals, you don't have any yeah, money invested. Right. You've already that's received right. all of your capital back, right? You have zero risk and you're still getting the check every quarter. Well, I got, I, I got one email from you that said I was getting 24% cash on cash. I got another one that said I don't have any money in the deal, but I was still getting an eight percent, as if I had the original investment in an eight percent um, prorated. So, man, that I was really excited to see all that. Yeah, I mean, twenty four percent cash on cash. That's disgusting. Yeah, what property is that? Yeah, it's Village. After we after we take our cut, we're still paying twenty four percent. Yeah. Well, on the Criterion front, um, we had a crazy second quarter. We we had doubled our portfolio in the second quarter since the beginning of it this year. It was busy. Um, and a lot of those properties we bought in, in May and in the second quarter are already paying out distributions. And, and another cool thing we started doing this quarter is um, electronic distributions. So we've been getting hit several times and it's just one of those things we've looked into for a long time. But um, those first distributions went out electronically and that was super exciting. Yeah, a lot of them we just closed less or maybe just over a month ago and already sending out checks. That's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. So it's, pr it's prorated for the quarter, but still right. um, we get that question a, a decent amount is when do I, when do I get paid first? You know, what, what happens now? I gave you all this money, you know, what to expect. And, and like I said, not every single property we bought on in the second quarter is paying out now, but uh, most of them are. 
And it was so fast. And when you think about it, from the day you close, you're making money. That first day you close, you're making money. The next day you're making money. If it's a Sunday, you're making money. So if we own that for 40, 50% of the quarter, why not pay out the distribution? That's kind of our thinking. So the topic today outside of distributions is uh, kind of an interesting one. So if you could go back and do it over, what would you do different? And this is interesting because I think a lot of people listening to the podcast are in those beginning stages of, of so many different buckets, right? You've got, you know, a bucket similar to Joel's who, you know, maybe they're flipping houses. Maybe they've got a little small rental portfolio. Maybe they've got a full-time job and they're, they're looking for a way to get into commercial real estate. Maybe they started like Brian did and, and you're starting to invest in the deals and you're, you know, still have another job. You're just looking to passively invest your money. You pay attention looking to get into the game or, or something similar to me where you're actively involved in commercial real estate through some sort of employment or working for another company or your broker. And there, there's a culmination of all of these experiences, but what would you do different knowing what you know now then? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, I, I have the longest journey. Um, I would say that the number one piece of advice that I would give people is depending on your goals, I wanted to make a lot of money and I wanted to quit my job. And the fastest way to do that is going to be commercial real estate. So, you know, I'm not saying you can't go ahead and and buy single family rental homes uh, and learn through that process. But from day one, I would be focused on getting in the commercial real estate side of things as opposed to single family homes or condos or or whatever other avenue you can get into. Uh, You know, cash flowing, multi-tenant retail, multi-family, even uh, some warehouse office uh, industrial that are cash flowing, I would recommend that. And I would, I would push myself if I was going to do it over again to learn about that first and, and not think. Cause I, when I started, I was thinking I was going to buy, you know, my first rental that was going to make me 200 bucks a month and yeah. cash flow, And then my second, that'll be $400 a month. And my third, well, all, I mean, just think how many of those do you need to do in order to replace $50,000 of income? A lot. <laughs> Uh, you know, if you're if you're making 200 bucks a month, that's 2,500 a year. Well, you need 20 houses, uh, all cash flowing uh, at that level, and and maybe you're making 400 dollars a month. Okay, it still takes you know 12, 15 houses uh, to get there. And for me, I didn't want to make 50,000. I wanted to retire early and and make a million dollars a year uh, passively. And so uh, I that that would be my number one piece of advice is to focus on how to get into commercial. Yeah, so I've got an opinion on that. Um, I I think the difference between commercial and residential is what people are exposed to and what they think is possible, right? So people don't do things that they don't realize is possible before they started to do it because they didn't know it was possible. Yeah. So um, especially in the part of the country where we're from, a lot of people's retirement is, hey, I've got five to a dozen to 20 rental houses that are are paid off or almost paid off or cash flow $500 a month a piece or, or whatever. It's just, it's easy to wrap your head around it, so yep. to speak. And yep. I, I think that's a lot of value we can bring in the podcast is, is just shedding the light on how simple some of these commercial transactions can be and how similar they really are to one of those residential real estate transactions. Because if you can get your head around the concept of a fix and flip, value add multifamily is the same thing. It's the exact same thing. Yeah, you're ba- on a residential, you're basically buying a single tenant you know, net apartment le- complex. Net, well, single tenant net lease deal. Yeah. You have one tenant, it's a person, they may move out. You may lose a month of rent when they move out. That's a big hole in your operating uh, income. Uh, but the commercial is exactly the same as a PL on a on a single family home. It's just bigger. And and what we're here to tell you is that you can trust uh commercial real estate to to follow the numbers just like you can a single family home. Yeah. There's there's no difference to them. It's just multiply it by a thousand you know, so, or whatever. So I love that, but let's, let's get more specific. Knowing what you know now, how would you, how would you do that? Because you were at the point in your life where you started to buy this first residential home. So let's go back there. And how would you get to that first hundred unit apartment complex, skipping over the residential fix and flips? What, what is your advice on how you would take a different approach? Or how you, I was thinking the same thing or how he's given an example of how would you get the first apartment complex? How would you just get into commercial real estate differently, if, if any different way than, than you did? Yeah, uh, these are good questions. Um, you know, once again, if you don't have enough, enough money to buy a commercial, residential is an okay pathway to start because yeah. you may be able to flip a house and, and make 20, 30,000, 40,000. And so those can be the seeds of buying a bigger, maybe a 10 unit or a, or a 48 unit or a hundred unit first apartment complex. Right. 
Uh, but what I'm suggesting is even if you're going to do that, start reading books on how to buy commercial real estate. Consider getting a job at a commercial real estate firm, uh, maybe an investment shop like, uh, you know, some of these, these capital firms that, that, that go out and buy, uh, you know, assets, buy multifamily, get a job at one of those. Be a broker. Or yeah. Or you get your broker's broker license. license, you know, just, just try to force your way into the game and start learning that looking for mentors, find someone that, that does what we do and, and offer to work for free, offer to bird dog properties, you know, just try to force your way in because it's so lucrative once you learn the game and, I know it seems uh, complicated when you're not in the business, but what I'm telling you is it really isn't that difficult. The P and L's are pretty simple on a multi-tenant retail deal. Pretty simple. Multifamily is a little more intricate, but still, uh, if you talk to a good broker in your area, they're gonna they're gonna have how to underwrite multifamily deals, and they can walk you through that in minutes, not hours. And and so you know, there's you know, average expenses per unit, uh, per year, three, let's say $4,000 or $5,000 and insurance is about $400 a unit per year. And taxes are based on this formula and you can just start breaking it down before you can evaluate those. Yeah. No, I, I think that's great. And, um, you know, I, obviously I get tailored, you know, I, I, I'm constantly getting ads on, on LinkedIn and Indeed and all of these job searching sites for analysts. Right. And I see everyone hiring an analyst right now. And a lot of people don't, necessarily know what that means, but this is the job for you. Um, if you want that job, an analyst is is kind of like the assistant to the broker, you might say. Somebody who's underwriting the deals, building the performas, putting together the package, they're gonna say, hey, use all of this all of this information, shove it in that model, send me the uh, outputs and, and let me see where we're at. Yeah, that'd be great experience. It would be fantastic yeah. experience. And, and, and it sounds like what we're coming down to is the experience and the knowledge to just know how to do commercial. Figure out as fast as you can, hey, I would do commercial and I would try to learn more faster in yeah, that yeah. in that realm. So let's ask Brian, because you have a little bit different, you worked in industry a lot longer than I did and you came into the, the space from an investor point of view. Would you do anything different uh, than you did coming in as an investor? Yeah, well, definitely I would do two things different. Number one, I would do it faster or earlier in life. Yeah, right? for because sure. I didn't invest in my first deal until I was 50. So I, you know, I'd recommend, man, just think if I'd have, if I'd have started in my twenties or even you, know, you were investing in the stock market, I was investing in the stock market, but right. let me, let me, let me say this to people that are listening. You invested in the stock market for 35 years. Mm -hmm. What did you like? Did each year you just learn a lot more about how to be an investor in the stock market? No, no, you I, learned I, nothing. I yeah. I learned nothing because you're letting other people I learned do that it. I didn't know you. how to do it. Well, and you're, <laughs> you're maybe learning what I learned is that, you know, all of these mutual funds are about the same yeah. and you're going to make about eight to 10% on your money a year. Yeah. And you're going to have some years you make 20 and some years you lose 20. Yeah. Right. But uh, that's a, it's an interesting point that you're not learning anything, just investing in the market. Yeah. I'm not saying don't do that. Put money in the market. But you should all also be looking for alternative investments and some that, that produce more of a passive income because it's really hard to quit your job when your money's tied up in the market, especially if you take it out, you're going to get taxed or penalized. And so... And you have to time when you take it out. You but can't real take estate it out is, right is tax leveraged passive income. And just think if you are getting enough passive income, then you could quit your job earlier. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but a 401k or a mutual fund isn't going to do that for you. Yeah, there's not a lot of passive income in, in stocks and bonds. I mean, yeah, the stocks are going to pay you some dividends and, and bonds are going to pay you a, a small percent. You'd have to have a lot of money invested to, you know, to, to make enough for a living to, to quit your job. So like you said, I didn't learn anything about stocks. Maybe I wasn't as interested in stocks and I could dig in. Um, I can tell you that commercial real estate and investing in commercial real estate, I'm really interested in it and I'm learning all the time and I'm, I'm learning useful things. So did you, would you say that, uh, your choice to start investing in commercial real estate helped you be ready to, to, to be an owner years down the road? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because, um, by, by getting in the game and just being an investment, an investor, uh, I, it made me interested because I had a lot of money, right? If you buy a stock, you can put $100 in a stock, but you're putting thousands, tens, or hundreds of thousands uh, as an investor in, in commercial real estate typically. And so, you know, maybe you're just a little bit more interested in, in what's going to happen with that money. And so it made me dig in. Um, I would look at, you know, you guys, I, I started with Precision. or um, and, and so you guys would send out some of the um, financial packages. And so it, it made me want to read those and, and, and learn from those. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, and then, okay. And then the second thing I would do is again, it kind of has uh, to do with being involved is I would get more involved maybe than just being an investor. If that's all people want to do, that's fine. But I wanted to do a little bit more than that. 
And uh, you and I didn't, we really didn't start Criterion until I was 60. Yeah. So um, again, I wish I would have started earlier and um, both as an investor and, and then getting uh, deeper into the game quicker earlier in life. Yeah, so there, there's no doubt that some investors and some people by nature ask more questions and, and inherently better questions based on where they're at in the process, right? But there's investors who try really hard to understand. And, and you can tell in the beginning, the questions are just, okay, let's, let's walk through this. I'm not sure you understand the, the full grasp of this. And then just as we go, it's super interesting to me seeing on deal three, four, or five, how the questions evolve. You know, they start to use the lingo a little yeah. better. And, and it's just this, learning. Yeah, yeah, you can tell they're learning and paying attention because at the end of the day, it is a lot of money. It is a lot of trust. It's a long commitment. It's an illiquid commitment. By illiquid, I mean, there's not some marketplace or some, some yeah. market your money out where of you can go yeah. sell your shares to somebody who you don't know. You, you can't. You have to wait until I tell yeah. you I'm selling it and I send you your money. So it's, And it's, those are the reasons I think I dug in quite a bit more than I did for stocks and trying to learn about stocks and bonds. But again, just to kind of circle the theme back here, it seems like you got to a certain point in your experience and education to where you finally started to say, hey, this is an extremely powerful investment. Yeah. The more I learn about it, the, the more powerful it seems. I need to do what I can to get more involved yeah, in this. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. And also I saw it as, as I started to dig in, I saw it as a, as a way to quit my regular job, my engineering job that I had for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And so it took me that long to, you know, I hate that it took me that long, 35 years to, to figure all this out. So that's what I'm saying. I, I hope that people that are listening to this decide, well, maybe they want to do it a little quicker in life, a little earlier. In for life. sure. Now let's go to Braden. You have a different experience. You started as an employee with a real estate company. Uh, you may not, you say, you may say, I, I don't want to do anything different. That was, this was a perfect avenue. Get a, get on with a commercial real estate company, learn everything I can wait for the times right, strike out on my own. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a couple things that, that I would like to do that I, you know, maybe could have liked to do differently. I, I personally love experience and in, in seeing how other people do it. You know, it's kind of fascinating to me just talking to other commercial real estate sponsors and figuring out how are you structuring your deals? How are you structuring your deals? How do you pay a preferred return? What sort of split do you do after this? Where are you getting your money from? So for me, it would have been fascinating to go to some massive, you know, multi-billion dollar outfit and just see, you know, commercial real estate at scale, like a, a Blackstone or, or something yeah, in New York. That'd be very mm -hmm. interesting. That would have been amazing. And I, I, that would have been invaluable experience to just get those connections. You had to hook um, up with like these two big guys from Oklahoma. Though. <laughs> yeah. and no, that was, that was a great experience. And that, that was at a scale that I didn't even think was possible in my head. And, and, you know, the more you the more you get immersed, the more you realize you're, you're like, you know, we're all just ants on, on the world. You know, we're, we're insignificant and we don't matter. We're, we're nobody, but it would have been cool to go work for, you know, one of the biggest, best It'd be cool, shops out there. It would be cool. But, uh, you know, I've worked for big companies and you only see a small portion. They tell you what you, they want you to do and you don't really know anything else that's going on or very little about what's going on. Now, if you bounce jobs around within the company, yeah. then smaller then, will give you access to the higher ups at the company and, and you will get a better sense of yeah. how the machine works. Right. So there's, you know, there's my ignorance of play right there. I, I haven't worked for big companies, so I, I just don't know what I don't know. And then the next uh, thing that was, that really blew my mind when I heard it is I was listening to Grant Cardone and he was talking about making a million dollars. And for me, you know, I'm, I was, I'm from a small town in Oklahoma called El Waso. You know, it makes a tiny town, daytime population of 20,000 people, tiny little town. So for me, the idea of making a million dollars was this, you know, like, how, how do you make a million dollars? Do you, have you ever heard of somebody making a million dollars? What is, what kind of house do they live in? What kind of car do they drive? What is, you know, what do they look like? Who is this guy or girl making a million dollars? And then I heard Grant Cardone talking about it. And he said, everyone is going to make a million dollars. Yeah, you could work at McDonald's for your life and you'll you'll end up making a million dollars. Do it long enough. It'll take you so much time. And then I started to really think about time, you know, and it was like, I don't I don't want to make a million dollars. You know, everyone's going to make a million dollars. That's it wasn't I didn't think about it that That's, way. Yeah, it's a good point. I want to make a million dollars as fast as I can. I want to make a million dollars in 10 years and then I want to figure out how to do it in five. And then I want to figure out how to do it every year. And then I want to figure out how to do it every month until it's to the point where I, I hate thinking about money and it sounds counterintuitive. I don't want to think about money. 
You know, I, I just, I, I want to be in a position in my life where you don't have to worry about money. Don't want to worry about yeah. money. I just want to be able to live my life. Hey, where do you want to go to eat? I don't know. Salmon sounds good. Let's go eat salmon. Where do yeah. you want to go on a trip? I don't know. Tell your ride sounds nice. Let's go to tell. That's ride. the biggest gift about this gig is, uh, just like if you had infinite amount of years on this planet, time would become less valuable, right? Only thing that gives time its value is its finiteness. Mm -hmm. We only have a certain amount of it. Well, same with money. Money is only a big deal when you have a limited amount of it. But the more money you make, the less money means and the less you have to think about it because uh, you can do whatever you want with money. And, you know, let's say your car breaks down or you, you have to redo your roof or whatever, and you just have enough money to cover it. So it just means less and you just think about it less. And pretty soon you eliminate the money problem from your life. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but. No, and, and inflation. And, and I wouldn't say it's just, hey, I need to do this differently because I'm already, you know, I feel like I'm grabbing life by the horns here. But, you know, you have to do things fast. I, I you know, I have I have three children and I'm 26. You know, that's that was that was very fast. And I'm not saying you need to go have a bunch of kids when, when you're young. That's not yeah. my advice at all. But me and my wife are, are starting to really embrace it to the point where it's, you know, we're getting all of the you know, hard, difficult stuff out of the way early. And by the time me and my wife are, are 40, I mean, yeah. we're going to have so much time. Yeah. Kids will be out of the house. Yeah. For you, uh, I think what you should have done, instead of starting in commercial real estate at 17, you should have started at like nine. Eight, eight or nine or something. <laughs> yeah. Because you think of I mean, all my, those years it's, you it's missed. Uh, 10 weird years to think of, about. My oldest son is 15, and he's almost to the age where you started full-time in commercial real I was, estate. I was picking up your trash, man. Yeah. Uh, not mine. Tenants. <laughs> Not so mine. another, so real quick, another one, uh, that I would say on how to, what I would do differently. Uh, when I started in commercial real estate, yes, I believed it, but I had, I didn't have all the knowledge. And then a few years in recession, the, the great recession hit and it really, you know, jolted my sense of what was possible in commercial real estate because the market took a dive properties weren't performing quite like they should be. And we were just surviving. And it really kind of skewed my thinking about commercial real estate. I, I always believed in it, uh, but I, I undersold the future value of commercial real estate, the appreciation in value, the growth in rents and all of that. And if I could go back uh, to my future or my previous self, I would, I would want to convince them that this is actually the, the best vehicle that you can be in. It's, it's so powerful. And an example of that is when I, you know, after coming through the recession, when I first started taking investor money, I literally thought like, okay, maybe this is risky. Maybe one in four of these aren't going to work. I want to tread with, with great caution. Fear loss was there. Yeah. Fear loss was there. And then we did one and it worked just like we thought, just like the performer. And then we did another one and it worked just like we thought. And then another one, then I'm four in, we haven't had one fail. Then I was 10 in, we didn't have one fail. And then I was 20 in, we didn't have one fail. And so, you know, maybe it's that I'm getting a little better, but I, I think it's really that as long as you stick to solid fundamentals, uh, these properties and commercial real estate should do what uh, you think it's going to do. You've evaluated the market. You know, the market has this much rent growth. You know, the occupancy in the sub market is this. And, and so trust the process and trust commercial real estate to do what it's supposed to do. And, and I would say to buy uh, early and often. I agree. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember back in 2014 to 2018, we had done several of, uh, of the multifamily value add, um, fix and flips, you know, if you want to call it that uh, over the country, all over the country at this point, and, and they were doing great. And we used to tour apartments that were for sale and, and just uh, talk, 40, talk ourselves out of it. 40,000 a door. I, it'll, uh, it'll sell for 42. This doesn't work. Or, you know, this, this rent can't go any higher. We're not going to get this rent growth. We haven't gotten that rent growth in forever. And it, it was just our modest assumptions. Like this deal is not going to work without some sort of massive rent growth. And it, it and it came right. Yeah, It's here. And all of those apartment complexes are selling for double. Oh, yeah. It's sickening without having done anything. They didn't. They didn't power wash them. They didn't put a new appliance package in. They didn't. They didn't fix the wood rot. They literally did nothing. They were just like, oh just man, rent's more expensive every month, and it was for two years. And now all of a sudden, our property doubled. It's amazing. Now understanding the real estate cycle, which there are graphs that you can look up online and articles that you can read, uh, it is cyclical. So we're talking coming out of the recession in 09, 10, 11, kind of bottoming out. Then it starts to heat back up. Now people are getting in. Now people are making money. Then that money gets 1031 and that money gets 1031 and it heats itself up. 
uh, uh, until you get a frenzy, which is what we had the last year. Right, a because frenzy. you're willing to make less on your money every time you 1031 it because yeah. you're just playing with fun money. It's not and even, You haven't even seen it. You can't see it. When you have 10, 15 years of stock market run and everybody's feeling rich, that's going to drive the prices straight through the roof. Now, uh, they're raising interest rates and we're going to get a little bit of a recession coming in. That's going to depress the market some. You don't want to be too early in buying into the recession. But as the recession sets in, uh, prices will either stabilize or come down. It, that, then it's a great time to buy again. But it's not a bad time to buy two years from now either after it's bottomed or four years uh, until you hit the next frenzy where everyone talks about surging prices. Everything's going crazy. That's when you need to start backing off. Uh, and so understanding those cycles will be a good uh, a good avenue for people when they're getting into the game is just be familiar with the cycles. And it's not unsimilar to the stock market yeah, cycles. Right. Good point. So I have another question, less to do with commercial real estate, but um, when when you guys bought Calidus, right, and sold it to Honeywell, is there any you know nuggets in there that you would have done a little different? Because that was a major acquisition and, and disposition of a big company. Oh, I don't know that there's anything different. Uh, all I can, you know, uh, all I can say is, when you're buying and selling a company, it's it's not too much different than than commercial real estate, right? I mean, you're trying to find a good value, then you're trying to do a value add, and then you exit at the at the right time. So it's really it's really similar. Do you feel like you guys timed the the exit right, or do, do you oh, feel well, like we, you could have got a little more oh, if you held on? Well, we got lucky. We timed it exactly perfect. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, perfect. As a matter of fact, it almost was a month too late <laughs> because and 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 the recession it was starting as when we closed, and so. Um, but that's just luck. And, and like Joel's talking about the cycles of either stock or commercial real estate, there are cycles, but don't try to time them exactly right. Get in when, when it feels right and get out when it feels right, because you're not going to buy at the bottom and you're not going to sell at the top. Um, now we, fortunately we did sell at the top, but that's not going to happen very often. Not everyone's, I mean, I'm <laughs> not very as smart as I am. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's a, that's a good point. So buying and selling commercial real estate, right? Um, selling a lot of the times, and from what I've seen, an observation is a lot of the times when I go to sell an asset, I, I really don't want to sell it. I assign some value in my head and I'm like, man, if I were to get that, I'd probably be happy. I'd probably sell. And then I'll typically add, you know, 5%, three to 5% on it. And I'm just like, let's just start there. Let's start at a stupid number. If they really want to buy this. We'll sell it. And we've sold a ton of deals that way. I yeah. mean, a lot of deals by just saying, you know, it's not really for sale. I'd like to keep it some value. Let's go higher, send it out and let's just see what happens. Yeah. Some piece of advice I would, I would give is that I would say sell less um, unless you're, you know, maybe four months ago from right now and before interest rates started going up and the market was just so crazy. Yeah. Maybe that's a decent time to sell. The thing is though, you're not, it's going to be hard to replace that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your uh, that asset have to sit out of the market because for a while. You're, if you're getting a huge a huge number on your property, that means that other people are charging a, a huge numbers for their property. Yeah. And so I would my, my a piece of advice that I would say is go into real, commercial real estate thinking that you're going to sell less. And uh, when you have uh, value increases, just take advantage of them through refinancing. It's tax free money. There's no there's no tax uh, that has to be paid. Tax free. You money. keep the asset, so now you're paying down uh, the the new mortgage that you got, and you get a majority of the money that you would have received from a sale. Only now you're not forced to go buy within six months. It's tax free money that you can just sit on and wait for the right opportunity. Uh, so I mean, not that, I'm not saying that selling there's never a good time to sell. I'm just saying you can usually take advantage of of a situation by a good refinance. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that was a good show. It was. Yeah. All right. Well, make sure to check us out on how to invest in CRE.tv. It is super important that you get on the investor list. That is the only way you will get in one of the real estate deals. Yeah. Or you want checks. Equity. You want yeah. these checks every yeah. quarter. Get invested in a deal. We'll send you checks. A million dollars this quarter. A million and, and easily to, to, I mean, we had 50, we had more than 50 checks. So, I mean, hundreds of checks going out every quarter for a million dollars. And they were literally people that we knew, colleagues we worked with, people that uh, listened to the podcast and signed up our investor list, um, which there's starting to be a decent amount of, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take it. Um, anyway, go to the website, thecriterionfund.com, precisionequity.com, how to invest in CRE.tv. Click the link. It's super easy. Name, phone number, email address, and then you're on the list. Anyway. We'll see you guys next week on how to invest in CRE. Thanks. Thanks.